as one of the most famous whistleblowers in the last century, our next speaker hardly needs an introduction. In 1971, he leaked what came to be known as the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. <laughs> revealing that the government had misled the public about U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War and helping strengthen the anti-war movement. Immediately after the leaks, many people, both inside and outside government, derided him as a traitor. And President Nixon started a fanatical campaign to discredit him, wiretapping his phones and breaking into the office of his psychiatrist to search for materials with which to blackmail him. Since being acquitted of charges, he's, re he's remained an active scholar, an economist, and an anti-war activist, and has published three books as well as countless articles. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming an American hero, Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you for being here. It's exhilarating to see a crowd like this on this issue. Let me tell you, I've been in much smaller rallies than this uh, very much of my life. And in fact, I think one thing, I won't ask for hands, but I think I actually may be addressing a rally now that has some Republicans in it, or Libertarians. Is that possible? Wait, I'll take the danger here. Do I see any hands? Let me see, even one would be nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. Because I think we have the chance here now, Fosfini, for a bipartisan rally that will be the start of a movement instead of the tag ends and the butt ends of a movement. In 2003, we had the largest demonstrations in world history against the aggressive war by the United States against Iraq. And I can't blame people for feeling that after those rallies, 15 million people worldwide in February 2003, that nothing happened. I can't blame them for feeling that being in the streets just doesn't accomplish anything, isn't worth anything. And uh, I think that here we have an issue where we won't get people that number. But I think we can get an active movement of a kind we haven't seen for a dozen years now. In part that's because when Bradley Manning brought out his information, which inspired me very much and which made him a hero of mine, he, I was asked just the other day on television, and, and by the way, uh, I don't usually advertise times I've been on, but just this morning, I did see one on NPR, which is very unusual for me, uh, a whole six-minute interview that is worth looking at uh, <coughs> from NPR, but one of the questions was, why the reaction to Snowden more than Manning? And I'm afraid there has been, there has been a much bigger reaction. And I think the first reason is very simple. What Manning was revealing was what the American empire was doing to other people to foreigners, to civilians, to innocents, to babies, to people who were being tortured who were not American, to people who were being assassinated who were not American. And I'm sorry to say it as an American, but I don't think it's just an American limitation. I'm afraid it's a human limitation. Simply not to care as much about what your compatriots do, what your colleagues do, to people who are not us, people who are other, people who are different, people who are enemies, even if they're babies, who our leaders say will grow up into enemies. So it's harder to get people. <clears throat> what Snowden is revealing, of course, is something that comes home to us, that affects all of us. And I think there's a potential there for getting Americans, Republicans and Democrats, and Libertarians and Tea Party and others, together on this issue to say, we don't want you in our homes, this has gone too far, and the dangers to democracy are too great. And to get people actually to ask, act for democracy. So, what I'm here today is not, to, is not to repeat the excellent facts you got here from Mark Klein and others. He was one of the first to bring these out. But to point to you some new confirmation that's come out, but also to raise the question of the broader scheme of what we, how we need to think about this, or focus this. Russell Tice. How many people here have ever heard the name Russell Tice? Let me hear. I see a few hands. I see about eight people. Okay. I spent my time on PBS, again, the first time I'd ever been on, interestingly, in 40 years. And uh, I spent the time to use the names that you've heard here before, and they may have gone past you. 
veterans of NSA, Russell Tice, who worked on black programs, secret programs, illegal programs involving satellite systems, William Binney, who actually devised the system which they boaterized and took away the privacy protections from it that they're actually using now, Tom Drake, who tried to ring, blow the whistle on this, and Kirk Wiebe, who helped again. Those four people, Wiebe, Drake, uh, Russell Tice, and um, who's the other one that I mentioned? Uh, uh, William Binney, right. And you can add at the outsider uh, Mark Klein to that. Okay, these people have all said, I, I by the way, have been getting more credit uh, than I have in 40 years, all of a sudden. Very positive attitude uh, in the media for the first time, which I could lay back and coast on, on the grounds that Ellsberg did it right. Ellsberg is the good guy. Bradley Manning and Snowden are bad guys. They're very different. They're very different. Actually, I identify with them, I identify with their motives, I totally support. I think the differences between us, which do exist, are essentially irrelevant. But a very specific thing that's come up more, well, Snowden is in Russia. He's not here paying the consequences of his crimes. Quote, well, I don't think he's done any crime at all. I don't think he should spend a day in jail any more, any more than Bradley Manning. But if he were here, he would be exactly where Bradley Manning is now, incommunicado, possibly for years before his trial, no, no uh, ability to uh, take part in the debate on these issues, essentially being tortured by cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment, which is in the form of solitary confinement, of course, not confined to Bradley Manning. There are 80,000 people, I believe, in our solitary confinement right now. It is a form of torture for all of them, cruel and inhuman punishment. That would serve no one's purpose for him to be back here doing that. Now, the reason I mentioned Tice in particular is that he puts in two dots to be connected, which yet, as yet, Snowden, I'm sure, knows the answer, but hasn't yet revealed the documents that uh, make it clear. And Tice has been willing to say now, uh, first on Sibel Edmonds' podcast, uh, boiling Frogs, but more recently on PBS, and that's the other uh, reference I'll give you. Look up PBS NewsHour, Tice and Benny, and the full, not just what they put on the air, but the full interview which they will give there, in which Tice says as follows. They are not, they both agree on the following. They are not just collecting metadata on every American, bad as that is. That does give them enormous power and blackmail power, but that's not what they're mainly doing. They are collecting, as Mark Klein put it, every word you say on email. It's being recorded. Is it being listened to in real time? As President Obama tells us, we're not listening to you. Kidding, kidding. To listen to have one person listening to every two people on a phone line would take more people than he really has, <laughs> even in NSA. No, he's TiVoing it. It's recording it all for later retrieval, along with all your credit card transactions, your whereabouts every minute of the day that you have an iPhone on you, etc. Do they have, quote, dossiers, as they deny? A dossier that was written out would be a room full of paper. No, they have just a little cube, sugar cube of the kind that you can keep the whole Library of Congress in now when it comes to storage, and they can bring it all up when they want to. The other point that Tice makes is that when he was in the government, in NSA, in 2003, 2004, 2005, he had in his hands the full uh, surveillance capability, surveillance uh, action, phone calls of staff, home and office of Feinstein and Pelosi and Colin Powell, Secretary of State of the uh, Secretary of State, and Justice Alito, which he held in his hands. Every Supreme Court justice being individually targeted, every member of the intelligence community being in uh, intelligence committees being individually targeted, the people who control the budget and who are supposedly our oversight, uh, every journalist, every source, every news agency, these are things we don't yet have the documents on. We may, I hope, will get them. 
should they be telling these under oath, such things, to Feinstein is useless, but let's say to Wyden, Senator Wyden, Senator Udall, uh, uh, Russ Holt, for example, and should Mark Klein be at last be able to talk to them directly? Yes, these are people who are already critical and who need every bit of information they can get, and they have not heard from these people inside NSA. So one, that's one thing, and Pelosi too, I will see. That's one thing we can demand that they do, that they open their ears, however strong their need not to know, so they can have denial plausibility. Oh, I didn't know this was happening. Make them accountable and responsible for what they're doing. Finally, a big uh, thing that's brought between uh, Bradley Manning and me, or uh, Snowden and me, <coughs> pardon me, is the motives. Are they whistleblowers? Well, of course they are whistleblowers. Uh, are they traitors? Of course they are not traitors any more than I am, and I'm not. Uh, it's nice to hear, it's nice to hear that whistleblower is no longer synonymous with traitor as it was in my day, that it's become a good thing that you have to fight about who is a whistleblower or not. But even beyond that, did they do it the right way? <clears throat> and I noticed that even David Combs, Manning's lawyer, <clears throat> in getting rid of this lethal blow to the Fourth Amendment, aiding the enemy simply by going on the internet that can be read by whatever enemies we have, that would be the end of investigative journalism right there, to add a capital punishment sanction, life in prison without parole or death for every journalism who's, who prints stuff from class that's classified from a source on the internet. That would close off investigative journalism right there. But the fact is that the prosecutions and the accusations themselves are extremely more than shilling. We're on the way to the death of democracy. We're not there yet. We don't have a police state, or I wouldn't be here. We would, I would hope for you, all of us, be in detention at this point. That could easily be in our future. And uh, after one more 9-11, for example, or a war with Iran, the lists that they've composed just by the metadata alone of our associations can put us all in camps very quickly like the Japanese in World War II. But there is something yet to combat. We're not there yet. And for once, the attention of the American public has been achieved by the drama in part of Snowden's own uh, resistance, his own uh, ability to resist the attempts of the government to, to silence him and put him where Manning is. Now, Kuhn's lawyer, speaking to a military judge, had to sort of apologize for Manning and say he believed this, yes, he believed that, but understand he was young and naive. Now, what is it that he was naive about? And Kuhn's is explicit. He was concerned about the people we were killing and torturing in Iraq, innocent people that he knew were innocent. He was concerned, he cared. And Kuhn said, isn't that nice that a young person should have such a concern? Of course, we you know, know better than that. And uh, he felt that he could make a difference. He felt that a better world was possible and that he could perhaps contribute to that. Uh, he felt that the US could change, possibly. Well, obviously, this is all naive, but, you know, not in itself, evil intentioned. Well, I looked at that and I said, well, wait a minute. I'm naive in all those ways. That's, that's my life here. And moreover, I think we're in a very bad course here. Not just America, but humans. When you look at climate and you look at the continuing possibility for nuclear winter that can extinguish our civilization with the weapons that Obama is leaving on alert right now and in Russia. We're in a very bad way. As Gorbachev said to his wife at one point, things can't go on like this. I would say it's naive, the conventional wisdom, which Coombs was alluding to, which is the opposite of all those things, our sophisticated, experienced, mature, older beliefs that, Tina, there is no alternative. Things are, if not the best of all possible worlds, the least bad of all possible worlds. We're the good guys, or if not always the good guys, 
the least bad guys compared to everybody. Individuals cannot make any change, so don't even think about it. A better world, a different world, is not possible. So get with the project, go with it, uh, you know, get your salary, etc., and uh, obey the leaders, take them for granted, and so forth. I think that way lies catastrophe. Now they point to the fact that Snowden is in a country that's has less free press than we do. Russia at the moment. He didn't choose to be there. He's there because they took away his passport and forced down a plane that might have taken him to Ecuador. But he is in Russia. Is that as free as the US? No, it isn't. And neither is China. He didn't go to China, he went to Hong Kong. But even so, China and Russia are less free than the United States. Is a different world possible? Yes. A worse world is very possible, and that's the way we're headed. In fact, without a Snowden, without a Manning, Manning I think I would have no hope, frankly. I, I wouldn't have the heart to stand in front of you and say, here's how we get to a better world and so forth. I wouldn't see what the hope is. But the response to Snowden has showed me that there is some leverage here. There is a possibility to use our remaining democracy and see that we don't lose the rest. I have made a point of seeking out other whistleblowers over the last 20 years and I admire them all and I feel a family connection with all of them. But three people I identify with very strongly. Like two others, Snowden and Manning. And I'm often linked with them and there's a reason for that. The fact is we are all facing, we were all facing lifetime sentences. Snowden not yet, but he will. Uh, and possible assassination in his case. So what I see are two other people like myself who are willing to risk their lives, life in prison, or even assassination. They both mentioned that as a real possibility and they're right. In order to keep this country from becoming like Russia or China. And to do that, they have to be in a country that can stand up to the U.S. and not hand them over to torture and incommunicado. And Russia is, how turns out to be a place like that. Venezuela would be better, Ecuador, Bolivia would be better, but we won't let them get there. It's up to us to see whether we achieve what they have each said was their highest hope. Informed discussion, investigation by Congress, and that cannot be by Feinstein's Intelligence Committee or the Intelligence Committees. They are totally co-opted. They are totally instruments to the intelligence community in secrecy. Can it be other members in Congress? Well, there were 205 the other day who voted against their own party's leadership, Republican and Democrat. Many, the majority of Democrats voted against Nancy Pelosi's arm twisting on this issue. So for the first time, there is something to work with, and there is something that is worth your lives to try to hold on to and regain the democracy that we have with all its flaws and limitations. We can do better than the way our leaders are taking us, and Manning and Snowden are holding up the model. Thank you. Round of applause there. Thank you.